On this episode, we're talking about voltage languages and a new operating system that can make a big splash in IoT. Hey everyone, welcome to episode nine of Daily IoT. My name is Kevin, and for the first time in the show's history, we are actually Daily IoT. There was an episode yesterday, episode today, so uh, we'll see how long I can keep that up. But stuff is happening, news is coming out, and so I gotta make the videos and, and get the information out to you guys. I want to make a quick note before we go any further. Yesterday, I talked about the Intel Joule module. I failed to mention, however, where to get it from. And uh, that is kind of useful, but not really because it's out of stock everywhere right now. But when it comes back in stock right now, the main distributors for it, uh, Intel actually does not sell this thing directly. Uh, you have to go to mauser.com to get it, or you can get it from Newegg. Again, uh, both are sold out at the moment. Um, not sure when those will be back in stock, but <clears throat> that's where you can pick up your Intel Jewel. Okay. News happening in the world of IoT. Um, really quick, I want to mention uh, Particle. If you don't follow them, they have announced that over the Labor Day weekend, the Electron, which is their member of the Particle family that uh, has cell uh, capabilities, um, you can put a SIM card in it and you can actually uh, talk to it, not over Wi-Fi or wireless, but actually over the cell network. Um, those are going to be 30% off over Labor Day weekend. So if you're interested or have wanted to play with an Electron, wait a few more days, pick one up over the weekend and get 30% off. Okay, next up, the big news that dropped, um, I saw the article today, apparently this was announced about a week ago, is Google is working on a new operating system called Fuchsia. Now this is not, uh, what's interesting about this is it's not an operating system based on Linux, which is what almost all operating systems coming out nowadays are some form of Linux or built off of, of Linux. This is uh, including um, Google's Android operating system is based on Linux. Fuchsia, however, is built from scratch. They started from the ground up and are building a new operating system. Now, a lot of people are questioning like, why would they do this? They have Android, are they trying to put themselves out of business? First of all, I would say, trying to put yourself out of business is a good idea because if you don't, somebody else will. They're gonna come around and displace you. But in this case, uh, there's a lot of speculation that Google is trying to get into, basically what I'm gonna say is, is the Internet of Things market. They're trying to get into that space where Linux is great, even embedded Linux can get down to very small platforms, but it still is heavy for very small microcontrollers um, and smaller devices that don't necessarily have the horsepower of like the Jewel, like we were talking about yesterday. And so uh, what they've done is they've created this new micro kernel that they're calling uh, Magenta. A lot of colors going on here. And Magenta, I was looking at the source code, it, it's, it's, it is, it's a micro kernel, it's very little code, but they're talking about running this on very low end devices, small, um, things like they mentioned like GPS units and things like that that are maybe running a, a lighter weight chip and but the differentiator here is that it'll run uh, according to them on things all the way up to desktops so they're looking to cover a broad range of devices uh, with Fuchsia and so I'll put a couple of links um, one to the article where they talk about it um, is a fast company article but there's lots of tech is all over this right now uh, with this announcement. Um, I'll link, link up one of those articles. I'll also link the uh, repos for both Fuchsia and Magenta uh, so that you can check that out. Just an interesting thing, something to keep an eye on because this could just be another experiment out of Google that comes and is around for a little while and then goes. Uh, however, with its um, target towards being more of like a real-time operating system, which is another thing that Linux is not, um, we could see this being a major player going forward in the Internet of Things. Of course, we could not either. It could just go away. So just something to be aware of, keep an eye on. It may be something that we're talking a lot more about in the Internet of Things space in the months and years to come. Okay, so I want to start dropping more, not just news every day, uh, but also things about the Internet of Things, concepts around Internet of Things to help people learn who are just getting started. My, my passion is helping people get started in the Internet of Things and learn more about it. And so I want to start covering just simple things that you may or may not know uh, to help you learn more and develop your Internet of Things foo skills. 
And so what we're going to talk about today really quickly, remember these aren't deep dive uh, conversations, just quick nuggets of knowledge, is voltage levels. And really in the Internet of Things, when you're building uh, devices, when you're doing hobby projects and things like that, there's really three main voltages that, you're in, that you'll encounter. Now, I know people are going to say, oh, there's all kinds of voltages, but there's three main ones, and those are 5 volts, 3.3 volts, and 1.8 volts. Uh, 5 volts is really what we used to be on, but now everything is going more towards low power, um, lower voltage. And so uh, the Arduino, if you've got an Arduino, uh, original Arduino, most Arduinos are going to run at 5 volts. Uh, they're powered at 5 volts, and then the GPIO pins, when you switch them between high and low, 1s and zeros, are going to output 5 volts and 0 volts. However, if you move on down to the photon, like the particle devices, photon, electron, those are going to run at a native voltage of 3.3 volts. And uh, then we get even lower. The Intel Edison uh, went in even lower than that. Its native voltage is 1.8 volts. And so again, the GPIO pins on that when they toggle between high and low are going to be between 1.8 volts and ground. Now, like I said, those are the three most common that you'll encounter. And 1.8 is still... Uh, a lot of hobby things aren't going down that low um, because of the thing that I'll talk about in a minute, which is communicating between these voltages. Uh, but just to be aware, things like there are voltages outside of those norms. The Onion Omega, actually, its native voltage is uh, 2.5 volts, I think. It's not one of the, the more uh, standard ones. And so it's important to understand voltage levels in IoT projects because at some point you're going to want to connect something to your base platform, to your Arduino, your Omega, your Photon, your Edison, whatever it may be, your Joule. And, you know, you may have a little LCD that you want to connect to it. Or this, uh, this is a barometer, barometer sensor. There's temperature sensors. Even maybe something like uh, this is an OLED uh, screen. And all of these things will have an operating voltage, a nominal voltage that they want to uh, be powered at and communicated uh, with. And so when we connect these things over communication protocols like SPI and I squared C, those are digital lines that toggle high and low uh, between whatever the native voltage is of the platform to ground. And what I like to refer to that is like the voltage language. You need to make sure that you're speaking the correct voltage language between devices and modules. And so if you have an Arduino, and you want to communicate with an Intel Edison, well, this thing's going to be outputting 5 volts on its I.O. pins. That's going to damage the I.O. pins on the Intel Edison, so you need to be aware of that. And there are tricks for handling that. It's called level shifting. I'm not going to go into detail on that. Um, we'll save that for another episode, but it's something to be aware of when you're communicating between devices. The same thing with these modules, these you know, LCD screens or OLED screens or temperature sensors. They're going to have a a voltage range that they can accept and you need to be able to understand when that you can't violate those rules so you can't take something that's a 3.3 volt max sensor and try to jam 5 volts on it um, best case scenario to have a very short life worst case scenario is you're gonna burn it out immediately so it's something to be careful with now one other thing that I want to cover really quick is this idea of tolerance and so I mentioned the photons native voltage is 3.3 volts. However, the I.O. pins are what are called 5 volt tolerant. And these are all things that you can see in the data sheet for uh, whether it's a platform or a module. And what that means is that while the pins will output 3.3 volts and zero, if you were to hit them with 5 volts from some external module, it will be okay. That's what it means when they say it's 5 volt tolerant. Or you may have a 1.8 device that says my pins are 3.3 volt tolerant, meaning I would prefer 1.8 volts, but if you send me 3.3 volts, everything's cool, I'm not going to blow up. And so that is just a quick, quick primer on voltage levels, just something to be aware of in your projects, especially when you're first getting started, you're buying a bunch of different modules and sensors. You need to understand this idea of native voltage language between devices. And again, I'll put up some resources. Um, SparkFun has a, a pretty good level shifting resource. So you can learn more about that. You can dive in deeper and uh, be more aware of that. So that is voltage levels. That's what we're going to cover for today. Uh, that's it. Just another quick note. We've had some uh, contest winners, Edward White and Everton Horning. Still waiting for the email, guys, um, to claim your particle core 
um, giveaway thing that we have here, the, the nice little kit that's got a particle core in it and a, bunch of, and a breadboard and a bunch of other components and things. Still need you to email me, kevin at sidwar.com, so I can send those out to you. I'll give them a couple more weeks to respond, and then I'm just going to pick new names. I need to get these things out and get them in the hands of people that are actually going to use them. So uh, that's it for today. I appreciate everybody watching Daily IoT, where together we're learning all about the Internet of Things one day at a time.